This is part two of Understanding Digital Certificates. So let's continue. Now, while there are many different types of certificates, here are the main ones that you need to be aware of for the exam. Class I certificates are used to verify an individual's identity. They are most often used to exchange secure email messages with another user. Class II certificates are generally used by software companies to sign their software. This provides integrity for the users of the software. Class III certificates are used when an organization wants to set up their own CA hierarchy and issue their own certificates in-house. Now, each class has different requirements for proof of identity when applying for a digital certificate, with higher level classes requiring more proof of identification. A Class I certificate often only requires an email address, while a Class III will require extensive documentation. Now let's take a look at the life cycle of a digital certificate. This process includes registration, creation, suspension, revocation, expiration, and renewal. The first step in the certificate process is called issuing. And there's a number of ways to issue or receive a certificate. The most basic method is for a user to create their own certificate. For example, if you happen to have the Microsoft Office Suite installed on your computer, you could use a tool called Digital Certificate for VBA Projects to create your very own digital certificate. One of the most commonly used methods of issuance is to use a trusted third party, like VeriSign, or a certificate authority to issue the certificate. Step one is to apply for the certificate. To do this, you generally register with the CA and follow the application procedures. Some form of valid identification is generally required. Remember, the amount of identification needed is going to depend upon the class of certificate that you are applying for. If the request is approved, it will be forwarded to the CA for issuance. During this stage, the certificate is created and issued to the user. Remember, the type of certificate requested and any existing security policies at the certificate authority will determine how the user's identity must be confirmed. By the way, this step may be called creation, issuance, or even generation, but the process is the same regardless of what name they use. If the request was approved, the CA then applies its appropriate signing key to the certificate, effectively signing the public key. The relevant fields are then updated by the CA and the certificate is then forwarded to the registration authority, if one's being used, or to the requested user. Now sometimes the CA may keep a copy of the certificate it generated, including the private key. A certificate, once issued, may also be published to a public directory if needed. This is especially true for certificates used in internet transactions. Now, certificate suspension can occur on and off throughout the life of any digital certificate. At this stage, the certificate's validity is temporarily suspended. Why would a certificate be suspended? Well, one example when this might occur is when an employee has gone on a leave of absence. During this time, it may be important that the, digit, the user's digital certificate may not be used by anyone else until they return to work. When the user returns, the suspension can either be withdrawn or the certificate could be revoked. Now, when a certificate is revoked, it's no longer valid. In some situations, a certificate may be revoked before its normal expiration date, such as when a user's private key is lost or compromised. Either the user or the CA is able to initiate this revocation process. When a digital certificate is revoked, the CA updates in its internal records and any relevant certificate revocation lists with the required certificate information and a timestamp. The CA signs the CRL and places it in a public repository where other applications using certificates can access it in order to determine the status of a certificate. The CRL is a critical element that provides security and integrity of public key infrastructure and one that you need to remember for the exam. 
And what's the identifying information used on the CRL? Why, the serial number of the certificate. So, as we've seen before, every certificate issued by CA has an expiration date. Once the certificate has expired, it may not be used any longer for any type of authentication. Now, a user may be reminded by the issuing CA or the registration authority of an upcoming expiration of a certificate. The user will be required to follow a renewal process. This process is something like the notice you get from your state where you live when your driver's license or your auto tag is up for renewal. If the renewal process is successful, it will result in the user being issued a new certificate with a new expiration date. Generally, the renewal of a digital certificate does not require the generation of a new pair of public and private keys. However, many organizations will issue new keys for security purposes. If the user has not changed their permission requirements or private and public key information, this process can be a simple one. The CA only has to validate that the person is who they claim to be and then generate a new certificate based on the current public key. The CA may add the current certificate to the CRL if the user renews the certificate prior to its original expiration date. Now, certificate recovery is the process for restoring a public and private key pair from a backup and regenerating a digital certificate by using these keys. This should only be initiated when the public-private keys have not been corrupted or damaged in some way, but are still considered valid and trusted. This process would not be used if the keys were compromised in some way. After the keys have been recovered for a user, a new digital certificate can be generated by the original issuing CA with the original attributes included. Of course, the public and private keys of the CA itself should always be backed up and stored in a safe location for business continuity and recovery purposes. Now, part of this is something called key escrow, which is the process in which keys for decrypting encrypted data are held in escrow so that an authorized third party may access those keys under specific circumstances only. An example of this is establishing a recovery agent on a Microsoft Windows computer that is using the encrypted file system to protect data files. Also, there's something called the M of N control, and it's used to securely store important keys, for instance, from the root CA itself. Essentially, this is the concept of backing up the public and private keys across multiple systems or devices. This method is designed to ensure that no one individual can recreate public and or private key material from a single backup. The key materials are backed up and then mathematically distributed across some number of systems, hence M of N. This prevents collusion between individuals for the purposes of recovering the keys without proper permission. It's used to help minimize an organization's exposure to risk of one person misusing a privilege and performing a sensitive action like key recovery without authorization. One simple approach to M of N control might be to double encrypt the database of keys such that two staffers each assigned one of the keys to the database are required in order to obtain someone's private key. Now, M of N control is also provided by some hardware-based key recovery systems, such as the smart card-based Keon key recovery module developed by RSA to control the private key used for key recovery. In that system, each entity is issued some percentage of the entire private key used for recovery in the form of a token. This ends part two of Understanding Digital Certificates. Please see part three to continue this video lesson.